So uh, next we'll have um, uh, Sumin Igor combo. So Igor will start 20 minutes, then Sumin will do 20 minutes, and then we'll have a shared uh, presentation about the, the talent proposal. And uh, so Igor is um, an architect, has his own office, and uh, teaches a research cluster one at Bartlett School of Architecture. Hello everyone, and uh, thank you Martin for the invitation. It's really great to be in this group of friends. Most, uh, so I'll start uh, basically kind of a bit about myself. Um, I studied at DRL, graduated some 10 years ago, and then spent seven years working for Zaha Hadid Architects until last year. But I've been teaching for last around four years at Bartlett, as Gilles mentioned, and I've been running my practice since I left Zaha. So basically, um, unlike Jakub's presentation, you won't actually see many buildings today. This is just a snapshot um, of what I've been working on in previous several years. Uh, also s collaborations with a couple of friends like Jakub, Sumin, Gilles. Um, so I will mostly be focusing today on kind of research work that we've been producing at the Bartlett. Um, I will start with Material Architecture Lab. <coughs> We're kind of, um, yeah, um, so what does a brick want to be, right? So in a way, same, same uh, way how Louis Kahn talks about this, we also question what would maybe the other materials want to be? What does a sawdust want to be? What does a rope want to be? Uh, or a felt, right? So kind of, we would always start looking from um, very hands-on, uh, low-cost crafting techniques, and then potentially translating them or automating them for further production. For example, here you can see kind of starting point of a felting project, uh, which kind of through automation of felting resulted in something like this, right? <clears throat> so the project Pinfill is kind of one of the projects from a lineage of infill projects, uh, meaning infill material in a soft membrane, uh, which were done in, in RC6, Material Architecture Lab. Uh, so this specific project looks basically into kind of um, filling uh, stockings with uh, sawdust, which is extremely cheap, basically reject material, and uh, solidifying with wood glue, basically creating a timber composite, right? And then through kind of series of um, techniques of stitching um, influences the shape of, of these sausages and kind of strengthens them or directs um, kind of the form, how they can combine into uh, larger aggregations. <clears throat> Here you can see a detail. And then basically thinking about how these individual pieces can start being kind of pre-cut into uh, elements that can combine into larger architectural chunks. Um, and then obviously kind of prototyping um, these pieces and you can see kind of one of the limitations obviously of, of, of a process like this where you basically have to have a piece that needs to dry and solidify into places and kind of how big you can dip basically into the wood glue. And um, so this is the image of the first prototype, and some of the details. So basically, all the kind of patterns are not just willful or pointless. Uh, they actually strengthen the whole structure and keep it together. <clears throat> and then kind of, if we want to go uh, larger scale, then you see how uh, the whole mold and, and formwork start to break down into smaller pieces with zones of overlap when, where multiple chunks would be connected. And then kind of, once we like this, like a, a week before the exhibition and told students, well, make two more, then it kind of ends up like this, right? And this is basically, I like this image because the fans are basically the only machine used in this process, right? For, for fabrication of this project. <clears throat> and kind of continuing on, on the similar topic, uh, this was basically a project following Pinfill, where kind of trying to move away from strands and uh, 
and linear elements to more, more surface-based <coughs> components, where basically you can see how a single surface twisted in different ways can produce basically, for example, eight different chunks or outcomes. And then kind of starting to detail all these connections, how do they connect edge to edge with the introduction of, again, very simple uh, flexible rubber pipes. <clears throat> and um, again, speculating on the architectural scale, how these components can aggregate. And then a couple of photos from, again, the B Pro show. And then what does the rope want to be, right? So maybe rope wants to be a chair, right? So we started looking into kind of ways how to create really fast and simple components um, out of rope and thinking of the ways, um, obviously, how they aggregate, create mega components and so on, but also how to solidify the synthetic rope, right? So one way would be obviously through kind of heating it up, melting, and turning it into basically plastic. However, it proved really difficult to control due to the shape of, of the rope components themselves. So, <clears throat> so just a kind of quick snapshot of, of um, the chair that you will see in a second. Kind of, um, we would aggregate these components, right, which are in this case black, um, and they would basically be uh, sprayed with um, Linex, which is kind of a layer of rubber coating, and then everything would be kind of tied together with these bundles. So, yeah, so this is kind of the process. Uh, you would bring a chair, tell them, hey, we are students, and then they would actually spray it for free. Uh, so, and this is the final product, right, where kind of all the black components are um, hardened and, and whereas the remaining rope kind of serves as a stiffening element. And then speculating on architectural scale and obviously uh, obligatory uh, cat photo. <clears throat> and then looking back at that project, right, kind of, okay, so it was super difficult to control the rope. So let's embrace that unpredictability and inability to control what happens once you, uh, <clears throat> once you burn it, right? So, so through this process, uh, the students basically found out that if you burn the rope that is kind of uh, loosened up, you end up with these really interesting kind of broccoli <laughs> fractal forms. <clears throat> and then kind of that you can actually control what is the outcome of the melting through kind of different thicknesses of the rope. And then very quickly you would understand that, yes, there are these kind of very exuberant and <clears throat> fractally forms on one side and then very stiff pieces on the other. And which would obviously be able to kind of uh, respond to different outcomes. Um, so these are kind of some chunks and initial ideas of how do we fabricate these pieces kind of through uh, inserting uh, guide, guide sticks and some of the results. And then again, trying to combine both of the previously mentioned languages where uh, kind of the, the thick rope becomes a stick and um, the fractal forms become kind of a joint. And then how you can also use um, the positioning of the sticks as a you know, design opportunity to create certain patterns or the openings. Then obviously, then thinking about uh, creating surfaces and so on. And then kind of creating this torture chamber, it's probably super spiky. Um, and then fabricating the, the final piece where you can see now clearly kind of what are the zones where uh, we have the very thick rope, which becomes really, really stiff, and, and then creating these broccolis around joints. And again, the piece at the B Pro show. 
and the detail. <clears throat> and now again, so also the previous two projects were kind of looking at plastics, but plastic rope. Um, in a way, reusing plastic and repurposing. Uh, but in this project, we were kind of questioning, OK, so there's so much you know, plastic waste. Uh, can we obviously recycle it and, and, and do something with it? Um, but rather than just creating um, a one-off piece of architecture, <clears throat> also kind of thinking about creating a geometry or, or combinatorial system which would allow for kind of multiple outcomes and reconfigurations of the architecture. <clears throat> so initially, the students kind of started looking at obviously casting um, recycled plastic. These, are, these were some really interesting results, but they very quickly understood that basically it takes forever to cast one component, about an hour, which just doesn't work in this kind of system. <clears throat> Oops, just some mixed slides. And then kind of uh, the ways how you connect these components point to point with introduction of um, off-the-shelf aluminum pieces or just through interlocking and kind of developing, again, uh, the design language of looking at different combinations of, of connecting different pieces, uh, exploring different chunks, kind of voxels, and um, producing an initial piece. And that was the moment, actually, when, when we understood that really this kind of process doesn't work and, and that we need to turn to kind of industrial process of uh, injection molding. And basically, which, which at the end was also really interesting, like these were also injection molded from kind of recycled plastic, um, but, and they ended up being so cheap that the aluminum, which is kind of supposed to be off the shelf, is 10 times more expensive than the components themselves. Right, so, so this is just a tiny snapshot of what arrived from China about a year ago. And then obviously starting to look into different applications, kind of from furniture design. Is it very compact and uh, using a lot of components or, or is it a very sparse structure that maybe introduces uh, kind of different material and kind of a couple of initial prototypes. You can see this actually at the ex exhibition. And then going into architectural scale, questioning the proportion and the amount of off-the-shelf aluminum pieces and, and uh, interlocking components, um, kind of proposing a f almost fully a structure which only fully utilizes the components and interlocking. <clears throat> and um, kind of thinking also so as I mentioned, that, that they were thinking about creating this as sort of a, a reconfigurable project and then proposing an app basically where you could kind of go online, choose what you want to build, how many components you can buy, and so on. Can I flip this faster? And then kind of once you are satisfied with what you want to do and you have enough components, kind of get your wall, it gets shipped to you. Uh, and then you can obviously, once you get bored, you can also turn it into, I don't know, 10 chairs or something. And then kind of just a quick couple of images of architectural application. and images of the final prototypes. So uh, I think each of these walls uses a couple of hundred of components. Uh, so more prototypes. The image on the right is basically kind of a snapshot of, of this final installation from, again, last year's Vipro show. And you can see that also we kind of introduced um, three different colors you know, to play around a bit, create gradients and so on. And then 
again a snapshot of how can basically what what we can use these um, interlocking moments for. So perhaps it's a kind of a, a joint system, or as you can see here, kind of uh, furniture pieces which are spreading out of the wall, and then kind of um, two is installations. Um, which I did last year with a colleague of mine, Christoph Klempt, um, which looked basically into uh, playing around a bit with a uh, discrete cellular growth algorithm, discretizing it, and then building out of uh, off-the-shelf or ordered components. So in this first case, Project Bricks, uh, we had a chance to do a workshop in Beijing last year, and we were provided with material so we just ordered a bunch of um, extruded aluminum profiles with this triangular section of 12 centimeter edge. And then basically kind of how the whole thing works and what we were playing around with is, is this just um, cellular growth Sorry. It's looping the same one all the time. Huh? And anyway, so this is kind of um, a couple of snapshots of the animation and our four videos, hopefully they will play, of basically the whole process. So the idea is um, they can't play at the same time. Um, so the idea is that you see how the surface first grows, then obviously we are looking at um, kind of the neighboring conditions of uh, velocity of the agent and, and normals to the surface, voxelizing the surface on the bottom left and placing the components with different orientations. Um, is this the same? Why is it going backwards? And then um, controlling different conditions, um, kind of different forces which influence the growth of the surfaces, orthogonal force, transversal force, um, kind of sparsification of the edges or smoothing of the edges of the surface, uh, image of a small kind of chunk. Uh, but basically, this is the more important, important part. Uh, this was the design for the final prototype. Uh, which, uh, for purpose of fabrication, we split into four different chunks and um, assembled over one day and a half with uh, students. So it's kind of like, I mean, th this is maybe, like this image is actually good as an introduction to what Sumin is gonna be talking about. Um, even though it's basically a component-based system, we had to obviously print out of the grid on the floor in order to start the first layer, right? And then we would always have to measure, look at the 3D model, kind of in order to build up layer by layer, and it was really, really time consuming. But this is kind of the final outcome. And then um, 
basically not going to be repeating the, the algorithm and everything. It's the same principle for, for this project. For this installation, it's just instead of kind of triangular grid, this time we were uh, using an or orthogonal grid. <coughs> and um, timber sticks instead of aluminum profiles. Um, yeah, and just kind of, uh, kind of couple of controls. Obviously, do the sticks all go into one direction, two directions, three directions, and so on? Um, playing around and getting these patterns. And this was the final piece um, that was again built in about two days. And that's it. Thanks.